We are in Ephesians and in chapter 1 and we'll be reading verses 3 through to verse 14. So let's read God's word together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In whom you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. If you have listened to sermons or read commentaries on Ephesians 1 to, or 3 to 14, you'll know that it's essentially one long sentence consisting of around 200 words in the the original Greek. It's this continuous flow of thought, a a, a eulogy of praise from Paul as he, a eulogy I should say, a eulogy of praise from Paul as he recounts God's redemptive plan in the church and the blessings bestowed on believers from and through and in all three persons of the triune God to the praise of his glory. He's so astounded and amazed by what he's recounting to us that he stops each time to speak of God's glorious grace, to speak of God's glory. I don't know if anyone has been to the Kataya Falls. Is it Katia? Kat- Kiati Falls? I knew I'd get that wrong. My Maori's terrible. I am part Samoan, so that, is that an excuse? No. But who's been there? Well, so if you've been there, you know that, that when you get there, the first, first level, it's a three-tiered waterfall. And you're kind of in awe as you stand at the bottom of the waterfall and you're just watching this continuous flow, voluminous water just cascading down the, the three tiers until it reaches you. And I wonder if in a sense here is Paul as he's recounting the blessings given to us from the Father that we obtain in Christ through the Holy Spirit. We're seeing the same thing. You can see each tear, but you're just in awe of the whole dramatic scene that you're you're seeing, the whole picture of what God is doing to us. And as I'm reading this passage this week, that's what I was thinking about. And thinking about how Paul, as he's going through this, is just praising God. And you see there in verse 3, he begins this um, eulogy. In verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's the main verse that kicks off this whole section, this whole passage. And so you need to understand it stands not just as a summary to everything that Paul is going to say in these next 14 verses, but it's also the appropriate response to everything that's going to be said. It's as though Paul is preempting our response. I mean, he's going to lay some concise yet deeply profound theology on us as we go through these verses, but when they're rightly understood, it should lead us to bless God. And this is important to keep in mind. Theology at times will confound you. We are, after all, talking about God, the eternal, infinite God. 
we are finite people trying to grasp in our minds the magnificence and the greatness, the eternality of the Creator. And so as we learn about God, theology is going at times to confound you. At times it will dumbfound you. It will excite you. It will concern you, especially when we think of the eternal judgment of, um, of the lake of fire. It will challenge you. It will comfort you. Certainly this morning hearing Dale read about how the Lord shepherds us is a comfort, isn't it? The truth that he is our shepherd. But though it may confound you, dumbfound you, excite you, concern you, challenge you, comfort you, what it should always do is it should always lead you to praise. It should always lead you to praise. Look with me in Romans chapter 11. The, the things that Paul will touch on in verses 4 to 14, he expounds in, in, in greater detail in Romans and at the end of it, as he's talked about Israel's disobedience, but how Israel's disobedience has led to the Gentiles believing in Christ, and then their believing in Christ will provoke the Gentiles to obedience, ultimately, finally. And as Paul recounts all of that, all of the blessings of God, all of the workings of God, and there's things in there that are, that are, are deep to grasp. But what does Paul do at the end of it all? In chapter 11, verse 33, he says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who was first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Praise. At the end of all of this doctrine, at the end of all of this theology, there's doxology, there's praise. Theology, as Kent Hughes writes, must become doxology. So this morning, I just wanted us to focus on verse 3 because it is going to be our key response to everything we're going to learn in the next few weeks as we delve more deeply into verses 4 to 14. We are ultimately to bless God. This is what we were created to do, to bless him, to glorify him, to praise him. It's what we are most content in doing, isn't it? It's when we are at our most happiest, our most joyful, when we are glorifying and praising our God, because that's what he made us to do. The word Blessed. So we want to ask the question, how, how do we do this? How do we bless God? And that word blessed in the Greek there in that verse is eulogatos, from which we get our word eulogy, which for some reason this morning I'm having difficulty pronouncing. It means bless. It means praise. Interesting, in the New Testament, it is only used of God. He is the blessed one. And so in Paul's Eulogy here, he examples two essential keys to blessing God. If you are going to bless God in your life, then you need these two essential keys that Paul examples in his eulogy. And here's the first one. And if you're taking notes, there, there are some notes that I did provide at the back there, or else you can write them wherever they are or record them in your mind. Your mind is better than mine if that's the case. But here's the first point, or here's the first key. Knowing the one who has blessed you. Knowing the one who has blessed you. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's opening line as a form of Hebraic praise. It was common in Paul's day, but especially in the Old Testament. So, for example, if you look in, you don't have to turn there, but if you can, if you want, but I'm going to quickly go through these verses. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 10, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, says to him, Blessed be the Lord. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 8 and in verse 15, Solomon says to the Holy Assembly of Israel, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. 
In Psalm 72 verse 18, Solomon again writes, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. And you see this constantly throughout the Old Testament when you ever see this kind of, this eulogy being used. And in these eulogies, God is identified by his covenant name and with his covenant people. The Lord, God of Israel. So look with me in Exodus chapter 6. Beginning in verse 2. And it says there, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan and the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people. And I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, the God of Israel, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so you see that the one and only true God, the the creator of the heavens and the earth, the most high has identified himself in Old Testament scripture as the Lord, the God of Israel. That is his covenant name, and they are his covenant people. And it's interesting to note that the last time we see God identified in this way, in this kind of eulogy, is in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, by Zechariah. And if you know who Zechariah is, he is the father of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet before the coming of Christ. He was the one sent before the coming of Christ. So he's the last Old Testament prophet before the coming of Christ and before the ushering in of the new covenant, which displaced the old covenant. And so in Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Zechariah said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, the same eulogy, who has, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And how was that accomplished? Well, through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that in, in Ephesians 1 7. So that's the last time we hear that eulogy, God identified in that way, in the New Testament. The next time we see this kind of eulogy, in the New Testament is used by the apostles. And listen to how it's used. 2 Corinthians 1.3, Paul, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then here again in Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice the change? The God we know and worship, the God we are in covenant relationship with through Jesus Christ, he's still the same God. He's still the God of the Old Testament, but under the new covenant, he is now identified as who? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The name of God, writes one author, has been updated from his identity with theocratic Israel to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to signal the international character of the new covenant in contrast with the old. God is no longer exclusively the God of Israel, but through one mediator, Jesus Christ, is now the God of Jews and Greeks from all nations. Israel, whose were the covenants of promise, and Gentiles, who formerly were far off, can now can know and have access to the living God through Jesus Christ. End quote. 
That's what the book of Ephesians is about, isn't it? It's the church. It's the bringing together of Jew and Gentile, reconciling them both to God through Jesus Christ into one new body, the new covenant. And so God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That God is identified as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ reveals the intimate and eternal relationship between God the Father and the Son of God. It's an affirmation of Christ's deity as Dale was speaking to us about as he led us through communion. You look in First John, uh, sorry, in John's Gospel. John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So he's with God and he was God. And then we see in verse 14 of chapter 1, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God the Father is God. God the, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God. And that's their relationship, father and son. That Paul also identifies God as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is not a denial of Christ's deity. It's rather an affirmation of his humanity because he is the incarnate son of God. Again, look at Philippians chapter 2. And in verse 5, Paul writes, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in the likeness of man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so in his incarnate state, being both God and man, Jesus then revealed to us not only the Father, not only what the Father is like, because Jesus is of the same nature as the Father, but he also showed us how to relate to God as our Heavenly Father, as his covenant people. He does this clearly in, in the Sermon on the Mount and quickly look there with me. In Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus is speaking of how we pray. In verse 6 he says, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to who? Your Father. Who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And then in verse 8, So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is our heavenly Father. When we pray to him, we are praying to our heavenly Father. We are asking of him things from our heavenly Father. God is a heavenly father. We want to honor our heavenly father, don't we? And so we obey him. God is a heavenly father and we know him to be grand and, and great and magnificent. And so we want to glorify him. We want to honor him. And that's again what the Christian life is, a relationship with God in which we obey and honor and glorify, we live our lives to please our Heavenly Father, just as many of us would have wanted to live our lives to please our fathers on earth. And so what is the outcome of all of this? Only that for you to truly bless God means that you need to know God through faith in Jesus Christ. You need to be saved. You need to be in a covenant relationship with him. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no other way of worshiping God. There's no other way now of, of praising God. It has to be through Christ. 
What did Paul say in Philippians? That we glory in Christ Jesus. We are the true worshippers of God, the true circumcision of God. It's interesting too, John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, Uh, Chapter 2, verse 23, he says this, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As, uh, and earlier than that, in chapter 2, and verse 22, he said, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And so this is why you have, for example, those who are, are still within Judaism. They don't acknowledge Christ as the Messiah. And so they're not in covenant relationship with God. Even though in the Old Testament they were God's people, until they acknowledge Christ as their Messiah, they're not in covenant relationship with God. And it's the same with those who would even deny the deity of Christ or his humanity. They're not in relationship with God and covenant relationship with God because this is who Jesus Christ is if you deny him then you are denying the father I remember uh, a friend of, of mine and I we were evangelizing we were going from door to door and we had, we had prepped by sending in these kind of uh, letter drops and then a week later or two weeks later we'd pop in and talk to people and one particular guy was talking and we were talking to him about the Lord and about Jesus Christ. And, and he, he said, well, well, I have, you know, me and God have this thing going. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, the thing you've got going is you're under God's judgment. That's, that's the thing you've got going. And he was talking about how he didn't need Christ. He, he has this thing going with God. He and God are this. And we're explaining to him, listen, if you reject Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you reject the Father. You reject the Father. We can understand that in little ways, can't we? With our spouses or our children. You, you, you reject my wife or you reject my children. How is that not a rejection of me? I love my wife and I love my children. And so even more so, Jesus Christ being God if you're rejecting Jesus who is God how can you not be rejecting the Father who is also God of the same nature and so to know God means to be in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ that's the first essential key to blessing God is knowing the one who has blessed you the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the second essential key is to know the blessings he has bestowed on you. To know the blessings he has bestowed on you. And we're going to touch on it here, but as we go throughout the book of Ephesians, we're going to just expound on this more and more and more. So we could never really cover all of this in just the one message. But listen, if you, if you were to go back to some of those Old Testament eulogies that I'd mentioned, and we'll do this, you'll notice that they are followed by a reason for the eulogy. So look with me in Exodus chapter 18, and you'll see this constant pattern. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 10. So Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, why? Who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Why is the Lord blessed? Because he delivers. Look in 1 Kings uh, chapter chapter 8, verse 56. And again, this is Solomon speaking uh, to Israel gathered in, in, in the temple for worship. Solomon says, Blessed be the Lord. Why? who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised not one word has failed of all his good promises which he promised through Moses his servant why is God blessed? because he keeps his promises he keeps his word he said this to us and he did it look then in Psalm 72 
and in verse 18. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Why? Who alone works wonders. Just a summary cap of all that God does. Who does wonders like the Lord, right? Why should God be blessed? Because he does wonders. And so then when you come to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, you see the same thing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is the reason we bless God. That term bless is again from the word eulogio and in this context it means to bestow. It's to bestow. God has bestowed on us every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. The word blessing, eulogia, refers to the actual benefits themselves. So you can see those three words all connected. The blessed one has bestowed or blessed us with blessings. The benefits that we've received. Spiritual, the spiritual blessings is in reference to their divine origin. They are of God, from God. And while God is the source of all blessings... Right, both material and spiritual, God gives to us even the physical blessings that we receive today, right? But this term spiritual, pneumatikos in the New Testament is associated with the Holy Spirit and is always contrasted with the natural realm of this world. And so they are those spiritual blessings, those invisible blessings that are from God of the Holy Spirit. And the fact that we have every spiritual blessing is in the context of salvation, right? God has blessed us, as one author wrote, God has blessed the believer with every spiritual benefit necessary for his or her spiritual well-being, end quote. The apostle Peter says it this way, God, by his divine power, has granted to you everything that you need for life and godliness. Everything you need to have a right relationship with God and everything you need to live out that relationship in this world, God has given you. He's given it to you. It says there that we have been blessed in the heavenlies. Um, This is an intensified word for heaven and it refers to the, again, spiritual or the supernatural realm. This is the realm where you have been blessed. Why? Because this is where Christ is, seated at God's right hand. And the blessings that God has given you are where? They're in Christ. They are in Christ. All the spiritual blessings given by the Father are in Christ. And when you were united with Christ by faith, all those blessings were bestowed on you. All of them. You get an idea of this in in 1 John. This is amazing when we just, we think more on this and we will think more on this. But in 1 John 5, in verse 11, the apostle writes, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And the life is where? It's in his son. Where is eternal life? It's in Christ. Look at verse 12. He who has the Son has what? You have the life. But he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Listen, you can't have eternal life apart from having Christ because he is eternal life. Eternal life, Jesus says, is that men may know you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus Christ. Likewise, Paul is saying, all the spiritual blessings that encompass spiritual life, that encompass eternal life, that encompass salvation, they're all in Christ. And you can only have them when you have Christ, when you are in Christ. All that the Lord has, said one commentator, those in Christ have. All that the Lord has, those in Christ have. Christ's riches are 
our riches. His resources are our resources. His righteousness is our righteousness. His power is our power. His position is our position. Where he is, we are. His privilege is our privilege. What he is, we are. Or where he is, we are. What he is, we are. His position is our position. What he has, we have. His practice is our practice. What he does, we do. End quote. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing for us. Paul, again, in Colossians, is just thinking of this verse. What does he say to us? If I can find the verse in, in chapter 3, he says, Therefore, you, since you have been what raised up with Christ, where is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Everything Christ is, the position that he has, all that he has is ours by the grace of God. And isn't that what Paul says there at the end of chapter 1 in Ephesians, where God has raised Christ up from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and God gave Christ as head over all things to who? To the church, to us. His body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So listen, if you are in Christ, all that is Christ is yours. And if you are stumbling in your Christian walk, if you are struggling and following Christ, if you feel as though you need more wisdom or you need more power or you need more grace or you need more comfort or you need more forgiveness or you need more love or more peace, I have to say to you, based on God's word, you already have it. It has all already been given to you in Christ when you first trusted in him. Can God love you any more than he has already loved you in Christ? Has not the Holy Spirit shed abroad God's love in your heart? Has God poured it out in measures? Or has he poured it all out? He's poured it all out. Has God given you only some of his Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit only come to us in measures? Or has God given us all of the Holy Spirit to us? Does he not indwell us? He's given all of the Holy Spirit. So it's not that we need more of God's blessings in regards to salvation or in living a godly life. It's that we need to appropriate it. You need to appropriate it by faith and walk by faith in them because you already have them. And if you're thinking, well, how does that work? How, how, how do I do that? How do I appropriate the blessings that they already have in Christ and how do I walk in faith in them? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at throughout the rest of Ephesians. So that'll be something to look forward to. But... I just want you to realize that if you are in Christ, then you have already everything you need for salvation. You have already everything you need for living a Christ-centered, victorious life on earth that will glorify God, that will please Him in every respect. You already have it all. Listen, this morning... If you are not in Christ, that is, if you are not trusting in him for the forgiveness of your sins, then to you I want to encourage, and you know who you are, 
I want to encourage you with this. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, took to himself a human nature like ours, but without sin, in order that he might pay the penalty for your sin through his death on the cross. Because the wages of sin is death. Right? We understand the concept of justice, the just penalty for rebelling, not against human authority, but against the ultimate authority, against the creator and sustainer of all things. The ultimate penalty for rebelling against God is death. The person who sins will die. And this ultimate death means existing in a state of eternal separation from God, shut out from his kingdom and cast into the lake of fire. The scripture calls that the second death. The first is your physical death. But listen, that's what awaits you outside of Christ. But because Christ was without sin, his death was rendered as the payment for sins for everybody, for anybody who would trust in him. Everybody or anybody who would trust in him. Doesn't matter how grievous or how gratuitous or how great your sins are. If you repent of your sins and trust in Christ, God will forgive you them all. All. So the question is, do you want forgiveness of your sin? Do you want to be free from the empowering enslaving power of sin do you want to be free from the eternal consequences of your sin do you want a right relationship with God where he will be your gracious and loving heavenly father if that is the case then repent of your sin of your pride and your rebellion and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the forgiveness of our sins, all of them, all of them, according to the riches of his grace, his unmerited favor bestowed on ill-deserving sinners. And when you do this, then you will know the one who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You will know those blessings bestowed on you, bestowed on us. And you can bless God in a richness of praise and life for which you were created to do. Look with me in, in First Peter. It's coming back. First Peter chapter two. Of us, of God's covenant people, of those who know the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in First Peter chapter two, verse nine, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look again in Hebrews chapter 13. Coming back. Chapter 13 verse 15. For through him then... That is Christ. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of what? Of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, when God blesses us, he bestows abundant benefits on us. But when we bless God, we praise him for those benefits that we walk in. That's why when we come together on a Sunday morning in corporate worship, we sing psalms, we sing hymns, we sing spiritual songs that express the character and the work and the blessings of God. We proclaim them. And you see that all throughout the psalms. Sing to the Lord. Why? Because he has delivered me. Sing to the praise to the Lord. Why? Because he has answered my prayer. Sing praise to the Lord. Why? Because he's delivered Israel out from slavery. And we do the same. 
And you see again that how they recount what God has done. The way we praise God as we recount the works that he has done in our lives. And that's why our song should be theologically sound. That's why our song should be theologically rich, not shallow or empty. They should expound the reasons why we are blessing God, why we are praising him. Our praise should be the consummation of our joy as we marvel at the salvation of God. And so if you want to enrich and deepen your praise of God, and I'm sure as every believer here, you would want to do that. If you want to enrich and deepen your praise of God, increasing your Spotify playlist to include more worship songs is not going to help. It's not going to help. This is what you do. I'm not saying don't increase your playlist. I'm just saying it's not going to help. What you do is you increase the depth and breadth of your theology, of your understanding of God and his salvation. Why? Because theology leads to what? Doxology. Theology leads to doxology. We wouldn't do this, but I was contemplating this in my mind. Think of a hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross, um, or any other hymn, think of that one hymn. Think of the words in that hymn. And then think, would that hymn ever lose its sweetness? Do you think you would ever tire of the words of that song if your understanding of God and what he has done for you was deepening every day? You would sing that old song anew every time wouldn't you because when it says that Christ died for me you have a greater appreciation and understanding now of what that is you're seeing that in you with a new understanding with a new depth of wisdom and heart and thankfulness to God so if you want to enrich and deepen your praise grow in your theology Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Church, you have been blessed beyond belief. How then will you bless your God? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we... We praise you and acknowledge you when we recognize and acknowledge and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your son, who in his very nature is God, who took to himself a human nature in order that he might die on the cross for our sins, that through him, Lord, we all, Jew and Gentile, might be reconciled to you in the new covenant. And Lord, we thank you and praise you because you have blessed us with every, everything that we need for a right relationship with you, everything we need for salvation, everything we need to live a godly life to glorify you. You have given it all to us. And Lord, we look forward to, to delving deeper into that, to learning more and more and appropriating more and more of what you have given us of walking in the blessings that you have given us so that you may be praised, so that you may be glorified in our lives. As the psalmist has said, bless us, Lord, that you may be glorified. Well, Lord, you have blessed us. So be glorified, we pray, in us, in all that we say and do. Lord, we look to you for wisdom. We look to you for guidance. We look to you for help as we go through this this book that was written for us, for us to know what you have done for us that we might live as you would have us live. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.